Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. With Wales heading to the polls in little over a month, Wales's two biggest parties of local government, Labour and Pike Cymru, have just held their spring competence. And we are joined by a guest from each party to discuss the position of those two parties, the frenemy relationship between the two of them, and other big domestic stories of the month. We have with us Meg Thomas, who is a delegate at the Labour Conference, and Rada Naya Roberts, who is a Plaid Cymru Common Ground candidate in the forthcoming Cardiff Local Authority election. Hello, Meg. Hi, Matt. Thank you for having me on. And hello, Rada. Hello, thank you very much for having me on. Thank you very much for coming on. So we'll start with, with Labour. So Meg, what was the feeling, would you say, on the floor of the conference? You know, that from the outside of a lot of people, the party looks in pretty good health, a very popular leader. Um, do you think they've got a lot of momentum going into the local elections? Um, yes, I do. This was an interesting conference because... There wasn't really much controversy at all, I think, with coming you know, straight off of a very successful election result and heading into the locals. People, there's a lot of, that felt like there was a lot of positivity, you know, in passing of the Labour conferences where you have kind of like felt that tension that wasn't present this time, at least as far as I could feel. Yeah, Matt, you're our Hiraith uh, party conference correspondent. Uh, you were on the floor for Labour conference, or in the at least in the building. What did you feel? Yeah, I thought it was a very positive conference. I think the main feeling was that everyone was really happy to see each other again after about two and a half years of not being able to. But um, in terms of beyond that, and in terms of the politics of it all, I thought that uh, one of the major interesting things was people still love Mark Drakeford. The reception to Keir Starmer was much more muted, I would say, compared to that of Mark. And the really, really interesting thing is that the leadership candidates are already working the room, trying to get support ready for whenever that leadership election might be. So I think that that is something to watch. The, the expectation was, of course, I think for most people that Mark would go next year whether the leadership candidates are just really eager and keen to get their support in or whether he'll go sooner now, that's something maybe to keep an eye on. Yeah, well, you can't now say that and say without saying, who are the leadership candidates, Matt, that are starting to uh, put their campaigns together? I mean, the, the list has never really changed, does it, Meg? It's Jeremy Miles, Vaughan Geffen, and Leonid Morgan and Hannah Blyden. Mm. Those are the four that will try and become first minister. It's difficult. It's yeah, it's difficult to go through. They are all lovely people. <laughs> it's difficult to go through Labour conference really without speaking to. So it's kind of like you do see, yeah, you do definitely notice kind of like the camp starting to emerge. Uh, uh, there's there are it's like always like constant rumours about when Mark is going to go down, but I would agree with. Matt, that was interesting. The difference in the reception to Mark and Keir was very stark. Is you spoil you the main consistency I think we see with Welsh Labour throughout is that dedication to the Welshness of it. And it was, it was you know, even though on the agenda or on paper it may see it may say the leader of the party is coming and that's and that person is Keir Starmer, you do get the sense of the real leader of that conference and of the people there was Mark Drakeford. Yeah, I completely agree. And another, actually, back to leadership for one second, dark horse candidate Mick Antonou is, is there as a possible left candidate for the leadership election. But only four people will be on the ballot. We talk traditionally about the you know, left to right spectrum within Labour, but there's also the kind of Welsh to British spectrum as well. Um, so who, what sort of alignment might might we see in the Senedd group and in Welsh Labour more generally behind those different candidates? I mean, I've I've said this on other other podcasts when I've been moonlighting on them, but even you know in Wales, even our Blairites are left wing. The cohort and breadth of supporter in Welsh Labour does occupy a very similar sort of centre left, soft left tradition. So this is one of the major issues with this group of candidates is that they do all sort of appeal to the same kind of voter. Realistically, I think that, that this is a very interesting election the next time it comes around because it will be on, I think, to a greater or lesser extent, who gets the support early and who performs best during the campaign. Because like, like I said, they are all appealing to a very similar set of voters. Even Mick, if he became a candidate, 
you know, you look at the kind of support that Mark had. It wasn't just the hard left. It was a lot of the soft left and centre left as well who backed Mark Draper. So they're all kind of competing for a similar vote share. I would say that for, for, to the extent that it exists in Wales, the right of the Labour Party would probably be more supportive of, of Vaughan. But that is not a hard and fast rule, I don't think. Meg? Um, absolutely. I think... It's, I think it's especially interesting this time around because last time, as soon as Mark Drakeford announced, he was standing, you know, oh, OK, so Mark Drakeford is going to be the left candidate. And as soon as Vaughan Gefford announced, he was standing, it's like, OK, so Vaughan Gefford is going to be the right candidate. And uh, Luned Morgan has got to come up somewhere in between the two. And this time, yeah, it's diff- it's difficult to know exactly where alliance- who alliances will fall behind. And I think it's also a thing of, uh, especially people like, uh, Vaughan Gethin and Alunad Morgan now have a much higher profile than they did the first time round and an unusually high profile for ministers in the Welsh in the Welsh government. So I think it's going to be really interesting. So I think that's definitely also going to come into play at some point. I, I, I think we could talk about leadership and we probably will talk about leadership a lot in the forthcoming year or so. Uh, I, I'm going to lead us into the next question, but I will say on the the next Labour leader and our next First Minister, I will be very, very disappointed if there's not uh, a really credible female choice uh, to choose from, because I think Labour really need that female leader. I, I thought it was, wasn't was the most exciting conference. I'm glad uh, you both enjoyed it. But the biggest thing that came out of it was the support of Senate reform and expansion. You know, was that a surprise? Not, not so much to you two, but on the floor, and, you know, what do you think the eventual position of that will be? Meg, as our guest, can you lead us into that? I think- I'm going to say the most interesting thing for Meg, of course, is she went to the conference as a trade union delegate. Mm. And the trade unions have traditionally been slightly more resistant to Senate reform than other parts of the membership, Meg, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, that is definitely what the most, probably the most divisive issue of the conference. There was quite a palpable difference in what was being put forward by especially the trade about some of the trade unions and some groups versus some of the some of the membership so we did see you know a lot of individual members support for a more proportional system going into it but for with some of the like larger voting blocks and the world executive committee there was not necessarily overt support i think in terms of for electoral reform it, itself, there's a pretty it was a pretty consensus that some that there needs to be that there needs to be adjustments made, especially as there is a consensus on the need to expand the amount of seat, people sit, sitting in the Senate. But in terms of what exactly that electoral reform will look like, that is something yeah definitely still very divisive. And I think a special conference was announced held this summer about on this topic and I think that is going to be a really probably the more interesting conference to look at to be honest. Matt did you I think Meg's probably summed it up but did you have anything else you can add? I mean this has always been a bit of a a weird issue Kerry I mean I remember going to national policy Welsh policy forum meetings about four years ago and getting audibly booed by the trade unions for suggesting multi-member STV I don't think it's quite as bad as that now but it's still not great um, and I think that you see the difference in attitudes from, I think, your rank and file members, most of them anyway, and your MSs, who are broadly in the camp, which says you need expansion and you need a more proportional system. And then you caveat and then you compare that to the position of a, a lot of members of the trade union movement, well, leadership. And the MPs, the MPs are less willing to engage with the idea of an expanded Senate because if you had 100 MSs in Wales, it would greatly diminish their power, authority and responsibility in Wales. But on the issue of electoral reform uh, per se, um, having looked at some figures drawn up by Labour for the Many who were there at the conference, uh, I think that there was a model made up with 100 MSs based on additional member uh, based on an additional member system which would have had um a labor labor winning 50 seats rich is nodding rich is shaking his head at me now he doesn't think it was quite quite an additional member system was it what was it rich 
Uh, no, this is, a, this is a, a relatively new addition, I think, to the discussion that we've been having here, which has been about between STV or um, constituency lists with additional member systems. This was some kind of modified P proportional representation list, party list system, but I, I don't think it's AMS, as far as I'm aware. I think it's something else. I'll try and dig that up and we'll, uh, we'll bring that into the conversation when we talk about it in the applied context, perhaps a little bit later on. Matt, Meg, just before the conference began, Ruth Masalski, I think I've got that right, of Wales Online, wrote a really interesting piece about signs of discontent in what should be a really happy Labour family. There was a suggestion that Labour members in the UK Parliament with seats in Wales were unhappy at the growing influence of the Welsh Government and even including some briefing against the FM. What does that say about the relationship and power dynamics between Labour at the National Parliament and Labour in the UK Parliament? Uh, as I alluded to in my previous answer, Kerry, I think that one of the reasons the MPs are so reticent to seeing Senna's reform is because it would change the power dynamic completely against them. There were, if you had 100 MSs and 32 MPs, they would be an afterthought in the political discourse of our nation. That is why you're starting to see some briefing against the FM and against devolved politics is because they can see a way in which the 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 arc of political power in Wales is 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 against them. If you look at the reality, the political reality of it, it's much more likely that Labour will be in power in the next election in Wales than it is in the next election in Westminster. So you 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 know if and if you're a younger person now trying to start your political career in Wales, where would you want to be? Would you rather go off to dusty old Westminster, where you know you're never going to be able to influence anything? Or would you come to the Senate, where there's a very good chance that you could actually make a difference? So I think those are part of the reasons why the Westminster group is starting to feel a little bit less happy than they had been previously. And yeah, I also think it's kind of like the impact of the expand of the expanding profile of Mark Drakeford, especially. So that that uh, again, I think there was, I think I think there was kind of like a feeling of being almost like threatened, and I think it was also so a feeling of especially within the well within the Welsh Genev group is more likely to be kind of like stronger devolution for the devolved powers, and I think there is the policy on the constitution within Labour and especially within Welsh Labour is. It is a rising, rising issue. I don't think it's quite at the boiling point yet, but it's becoming, a, definitely it's becoming an increasing tension between the two. And I also think, yeah, kind of like, I think a lot of the politics between the MPs and the MSs are very different. I think that the kind of like, for example, when Matt says earlier, even our Blairites left wing, I don't necessarily think that's the case for the MPs at all. If anything, there are probably some of the most, some of the more right wing MPs that there are in the Labour group, and I think there was definitely tension in that, in that. Yeah, I completely agree with Meg on that. I think on that last point, I think the natural political gravity in the Welsh Labour MPs, although I wouldn't say right wing, is much less to the left than the Senedd group. When I'd say the natural political gravity in in the Senedd group is very much the soft left, centre left. Apart from people maybe like Beth Winter, you know that that she, who who is who is viewed as a radical in, in Westminster circles, but would probably just be pretty centre of the pack in, in the Senate. I think we've certainly discussed Labour enough for my liking uh, at this point in the proceedings. But there was, of course, the, the Plaid Cymru conference, uh, and I know uh, rather you were there, Matt, you were there as well. So with the party still trying to find its feet after, you know, what we must admit was a slightly disappointing election last year, it appeared that to pull the rabbit out of the hat, as it were, by agreeing a coalition in all but name of the Welsh Government, how, how was the mood in that kind of regard at the at conference, rather? Well, it wasn't really touched upon in my session, which was women in local government, but the feeling I got was that everyone was very positive and I was just really glad to be together again, face to face. And I just felt like the mood was one of 
yeah, let's get together and let's do this. It was very forward looking and it was also very comfortable. You know, in particular, my audience was incredibly kind given that I'm a first time politician and I've never stood for anything before. But I, I did feel like the mood was very upbeat as if, you know, we have a lot to play for going into the next um, parliament, Senate, I guess, in that, you know, we have not compromised on anything. And frankly, Labour are not doing such a good job. There's a lot of child poverty, there's hunger, there's a cost of living crisis. And, you know, they can pat themselves on the back. But the reality is, you know, there are many dark clouds on the horizon for Wales. And many people are going to wake up in April and discover their energy bills have doubled or tripled or gone up 10 times. And what is Wales doing? What is Welsh Labour doing to address this crisis? At the same time, Mark Drakeford, though he was one of my favourite politicians, has just completely ruined things by acquiescing to England's lead on masks and dropping all the um, mitigations against COVID. And what we're seeing now is COVID cases going through the roof and hospitals filling up. And, you know, it was an irresponsible thing to do. And as a scientist who studied viruses and who knows exactly how they work, I was appalled at this decision. But I've, I've drifted off. The conference was lovely. And I'd like to thank Helad Bachan, who ran the session about lo women in local government, and um, Emily Edwards, who made sure, I'm a wheelchair user, who made sure everything was very, very smooth for someone with a disability like me. And I just felt welcomed and I felt like, in spite of being disabled, I was able to speak out at the conference and make, connect with lots of people. Matt. You know, how did you find things uh, on the floor, the delegates? Did you find any questioning of that cooperation agreement or last year's election? Uh, well, I find it quite interesting, Kerry, because although it, uh, like Radha said, was very positive, I think most of that was due to just the ability to be around each other again rather than actual necessarily having any optimism in the politics. And I think that it's very telling that Adam, in his speech, you know, for the first time, expressed disappointment at the result. And I think that that contrition, I think, is very important, actually, if Plyde are ever going to really want to rebuild and become an election winning force, because it just it's it's an admission that maybe something wasn't quite right in the campaign uh, fr from last time round. I think, you know, otherwise it was, yeah, quite, like, like I said, quite a nice conference. I think, I think it's really unfair to criticise Plyde's performance at the election because you can't have it in have its performance in isolation of COVID and the fact that we were in a pandemic. And I'd be the first to admit that until this week, Mark Drakeford did an amazing job on dealing with the COVID pandemic. That was a major factor in Plyde's performance at the last election. I don't think anyone could deny that. The context of COVID was fantastic for Mark Drakeford and he really responded to it. And he earned my, my respect on that as someone who has a biomedical background, but he lost it all this week by completely abandoning masks and abandoning self-isolation. And worst of all, abandoning PCR testing. So Adam's now nearly four years into his leadership of the party. And while there appears to be a great deal of unity around the party's platform at present, his leadership perhaps hasn't been as transformational as some might have expected or even hoped. Where do you think the party's headed under Adam's leadership and where can they gain ground politically? In a way, I think that Plaid keeps Labour honest in Wales because when Labour, Welsh Labour, is drifting to the right, Plaid is there to remind them that actually they're supposed to be a socialist party. I grew up in France, so I've seen what real socialism is. And, you know, under Welsh Labour, it's not what we're getting. And that's such a crying shame, because if we'd adopted more socialist policies under Welsh Labour, we could be in so much of a better position. 
with things like the cost of living crisis and the energy crisis and, you know, child poverty and even public transport. I mean, my reason for running in the local election is that I live on the front line of the LDP, of the Cardiff LDP. And overnight, over the last five years, we now live in a building site. And the stark contrast between, you know, what money is being spent on people and that spent on building houses is very, very clear. For one reason or another, they've managed to build hundreds of houses on green fields, you know, 300 yards away, but they haven't managed to refurbish our playground. And it just speaks to me of, you know, they've legislated that play is important and yet they do this. So the hypocrisy and the complacency of labor really get to me. I, I certainly understand where you're coming from, Radha. As you know, I'm standing as well. But Rich, if I can ask you as a as a kind of plied leaning uh, house, you know, where, where do you think Adam's leadership is at the moment, and where, where do you think Plaid can make that political ground? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting to think about what the what the Adam Price project is in Plaid Cymru because his predecessor Leanne Wood had a very clear identity and she really had a clear vision about where she wanted to take the party over the course of her tenure as leader. I mean ultimately it came to a very sudden end when I think the party decided or the party membership decided that that wasn't the direction that they wanted to go and I think that there was an awful an awful lot of hope um, about Adam and what his you know, considerable talents applied in the right way could do could bring to the party and if you look back in time, the first election, major election that he um, oversaw as leader was the uh, 2019 European elections that, um, where Ply Cymru did very well, considerably worse than the Brexit party, which was the most popular party in Wales in that particular election, but by Plaid standards did really well and actually beat the Labour Party in a national poll for the first time. So, so I think people felt that there was a real sense of momentum there um, that maybe then didn't carry itself through to the same way through 2019 and then 2021. And I think that there's a question of identity about Plaid Cymru because you have, you know, Plaid is a coalition of different interests in the same way that every political party is. And I think that, that the ability of a leader is to kind of unite all of those interests in a way that actually wins elections. Now, what we've seen from Adam is a very skillful negotiation of the post-election period where now the coalition uh, not coalition what's it called uh, cooperation agreement is in place and he's managing to get a lot of the benefits of um being in coalition without actually being in coalition but but i think that you you run the risk of rerunning what happened to yeah and win jones back in before 2011 in those circumstances uh, potentially in that the public might see certain things being done and, you know, the case of free school meals is one of those cases. They may see it being done under the badge of the Welsh Government, which is, of course, the Labour-led Welsh Government, without necessarily Plaid being able to be able to claim the ownership of that policy, which is something that they, they have been trying to do. So where that fits in the kind of overall vision that, Plaid, uh, that Adam Price has for the party, I think is that's the thing that I'm not so sure about. He's... Um, managed to do do an awful lot of things to to raise his profile and the, the the party's profile in British media over the last couple of years. But what is the identity of Plaid Cymru? I think that is a question that has still kind of yet to be determined. And I don't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing, because, of course, the old Tony Blair adage is that as soon as you make a political decision, then you lose a number of voters. So maybe there's a degree of ambiguity there that is strategic to try and bring in some of the um, the traditional Plaid Cymru voters from Avrog and Reich, uh, with some maybe some you know urban voters, Vannies voters, etc. Maybe that's helpful. But um, yeah, I think that that kind of articulating that vision of what the, the, the party is under Adam, I think that's still a work in progress, but it doesn't seem that there's any lack of support from the membership or certainly the people in conference that, are, that I'm aware of. Everybody does feel that it's going as well, you know, as it could be expected at the moment, particularly given how Mark Drakeford and the Welsh Labour profile has rocketed over the course of the pandemic. And I don't think, I think in the face of that, I think it would be very difficult for any party in Wales to really seriously challenge Welsh Labour as a party of government. Uh, and for, for reference, I think you can see the Conservatives 
you know, they had an awful lot of um, potential assets going into the election, uh, and they they struggled quite a lot against Labour as well. And one would suspect, um, and this you know, linking back to what Radha was just talking about with the local government elections on the horizon, one would suspect that the Welsh Labour Party are in line for quite a good election result in May. And I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens, particularly with the Conservative vote in that context, because the Conservatives are widely thought to be not expecting to have a great election period. And it'll be very interesting to see what happens with the Plaid vote, which in Plaid being the second party of local government in Wales at the moment, one would expect that they stay there. Um, but whether they can catch the Labour Party, I think is I think in this election that, you know, the odds are not in the favour of being able to do so. But uh, I'm, I'm sure that's not going to be for want of effort from candidates like Radha uh, across Wales. So all this political manoeuvring, it just seems very abstract when compared to the problems that are going to be facing people Im immediately, which is, you know, their, their energy bills are going to go up tomorrow two or three times and who can afford that all because we've been let down by yes the Tories in Westminster but also by Welsh Labour who haven't cushioned us against this I remember when energy prices were high and we did something called Kid Cymru where we did a group bargaining on behalf of different councils across Wales and it was very effective I joined that and I'm wondering you know, Labour have got, are in power, how come they're not organising something like that? And when people are going to not be able to afford to heat or eat, who will they blame? They will probably blame Westminster because that's what Mark Drakeford does, but it has, the buck has to stop at some point. Um, and this is probably why I feel so comfortable as a member of Plaid, because in our heads, we're already independent. And we don't have to rely on Westminster anymore. So, you know, those issues are the ones that are important. I'm not really au fait with politics as, you know, politics. I'm more interested in what it means to ordinary people and how we could make life better for them. And I think there are many ways we could do better. We've been talking about social care and how there should be a national social care system as opposed to getting private companies to do the, the services, because it always works, works out more expensive. So, you know, Labour can pretend to be socialist, but they are the author of policies like this. Agency staff, private healthcare for, or social care. And, you know, they can say what they want, but on the ground, what you see happening is not what they say at conference. So I'm sorry to be so brash and passionate, but I feel really passionate. I'm a mother and I just want my children to have a better world to grow up in. I think we'd all agree that that's what we want is that, that better future for future generations. And I just want to thank both you and Meg for joining us tonight um, for our review of the conference season, spring conferences anyway. Uh, if people want to hear uh, from you in future where can they find you are you on twitter Radha? i am i'm at brada but i'm also um my tagline is rada for rada so that's rada r a d h a for rada r a d y r and meg where can people find you uh yeah you can find me on twitter at at megan Nia thomas uh, the, you could do uh, like a side project I was involved with called that that's devolved so of course party conferences are but just one thing that has lived in the political memory of Wales this month joining me to talk a little bit more about what else has happened is Richard Martin hello Rich hey Matt and Kerry Davis who has the Rona it seems hello Kerry evening gentlemen Rich, what other interesting political developments have we seen this month that you want to have a chat about? Uh, well, it's not necessarily political, but it's certainly um, been talked about in political circles. And I think that the position of the monarchy has been one of the more um, pulse quickening discussions on all sides of the debate over the last uh, month. Not only was the, the fairly disastrous tour of uh, the Caribbean by 
William and Kate um, that ultimately culminated in an aborted trip to Belize because of protests and then Jamaica declaring that it was going to remove the Queen as the head of state. The Queen herself is, is appearing to be increasingly frail and as we saw at the, um, the memorial for Prince Philip, a lot of people started thinking about whether we are um, approaching the time at which the head of state will change. And, you know, wrapped into that was the complexities about her being escorted down the aisle by Prince Andrew in a very public way, which suggests that the royal family has not quite given up on its uh, second son um, at the moment. And then, of course, we have the, <laughs> the crowning cherry on the top of the debate uh, at the moment, which is the um, UK government produced... A patriotic book which has been or, or is intended to create a shared understanding of the monarchy's role in the United Kingdom which you know cuts across a number of different things I mean particularly the phrase about common understanding I think is is particularly loaded when the book has been written very clearly from a and unilaterally from a particular perspective and whilst copies may have been translated into Welsh they may not have been translated into the language of the people who live in Wales, um, the common language of talking about priorities and understand, shared understanding of our role in the United Kingdom. And Welsh Government has uh, taken the absurd controversialist point of view that as the government responsible for the education of children in Wales, that it will choose the policy for distribution uh, of this book to educational institutions in Wales, uh, a similar approach just adopted by the Scottish government. And this has inflamed tensions. And, and one, one thinks about it in, in the political context, because there's a very clear political dividing line between those who champion the book and its as yet unpublished contents, um, and those who maybe take a small cautious point of view. But it also splits, uh, you know, kind of republicanism and monarchy uh, and monarchism down party lines as well. And I think that that's that debate is, you know, we've talked about third rails before, you know, support for the monarchy uh, is a political third rail, and yet it has been brought front and centre by this uh, unforced error on behalf of the UK government. And I just, I think it's interesting about the different positions that are being taken, particularly the fact that Keir Starmer hasn't addressed the issue in a way that I think if I was a journalist in London, I probably would have uh, raised with him by now. But maybe, you know, in the greater scheme of things, you know, war in Eastern Europe, you know, cost of living crisis, people struggling um, to stay healthy and well fed, uh, maybe it isn't the biggest thing in the world, but it's certainly an interesting uh, subject. I, be, I really want someone to ask him that question now, uh, mainly because it would be really awkward for him with the leftists of the party already hating him. But broadly speaking, Rich, I think it's, yeah, it is quite interesting, isn't it, about the, uh, this this decision by the Welsh government, but of course Wales is the most republican nation of the UK, so I'm all for the Welsh government's decision personally. Well, I, I was just going to be flippant. I, I think Welsh government should provide every school copies of our recent guest James Stafford's "How We Beat the Mighty All Blacks" book as be far more suitable than any kind of jubilee book, and I think that's something all political parties in Wales can get behind considering our last rugby outing. But um, I'm, going to, I'm going to say the whole furore about the book uh, does just grate on me a little. It wouldn't be something I'd support, but it just brings to mind to me what Steve Thomas and a couple of others said in recent pods. It's what is our politics? We're focusing on a book for schools. And yet in the same week, we've got 14 hour waiting lists at the new Grange Hospital in Gwent. And it's you know, just we're, we're, what do we focus on? We have all this furore about a book, and yet where we have got real issues on the ground, it just doesn't seem to get a huge deal of coverage. I find it incredibly frustrating. Let's talk about the Granger, though, Kerry, because I don't know whether you saw the topical question in the Senate table by Russell George to Aline Morgan the, uh, the other day. I did not. It. After after the uh, the Grange declared a, ba a a black incident, I think it's called a black alert, major incident. Uh, basically, yes, as you said, with these ridiculous waiting times. But then you listen to the justification from Aline Ed Morgan uh, on that basis that basically they needed the beds, they desperately needed the beds a few months ago, and you know when asked whether they were right to open it, 
early. She said, damn right, we were right to open it early. And it's it's it just shows the kind of extreme pressure that the NHS is under in Wales, but also that the NHS is under in England. As she said in her response to that question, you know, the the the, the hospital in Shrewsbury also declared a major incident. The, the hospital in Hereford declared a major incident the same day. So I know we focus on Wales and we're right to do that and focus on the shortcomings of Welsh government decisions and NHS decisions here, but it's not an it's not unique. In Wales, we're not unique with the dangers and that the problems that are facing the NHS due to chronic underfunding for quite a while now. But, but you know, if, I, if I can, if I can just because I I totally agree with you. Um, I was going to mention Hereford actually. Hereford from a Mid Wales boy is the local hospital, and I think they were at ten hour plus waits. So it is totally cross border. Totally get that, and I don't mind who focuses on these issues. It's not really obviously political. And I, it's just bringing back to the you know, like I said, I was really taken with what Steve said in his podcast about. A flag in Cardiff can have a brawl, yet Betsy Cadwallader being in special measures for, what, um, six, seven years now, just doesn't get any... And I just found it quite similar, the Ferrari about the book and the hospitals, whether they're on our side of the dike or the other side, it's a very similar position. Has anybody yet managed to watch Gwynidog Yeke, The Mount Pandemic, the S4C programme on Alina Morgan during the, the end of last year. It's very worth a watch. I would strongly recommend our listeners and you guys listen to, uh, what, sorry, watch that, that show because I think it does go some way to explaining the kind of pressure the NHS is under and that no matter, kind of, it, it's, we're at the stage now where no matter how much money you throw at it, it's going to take years and years and years to clear the backlog here because you, you just, you can't magic staff and staff, uh, staff retention is very hard to do. Uh, recruitment is very hard to do in the NHS at the moment. So it's, it's going to take, sadly, it's going to take years to clear these backlogs. And I think that for all the, 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 the negativity towards the, towards the health minister, um, I, think that, I think we just have to appreciate this is not her fault. This is the fault of, one, a pandemic, and two, generations of failure to plan for this kind of eventuality. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and I could say this is the person who edits this podcast, I think it's a tremendous thing that Leonard Morgan's campaign staff were able to get that programme commissioned coincidentally at the uh, around the time of the uh, Spring Conference. I think it was excellent. Um, uh, I, you're absolutely right, Kerry, and I, I, I don't think anyone will argue uh, with you about the, you know, the disproportional um, column inches that have been given over Oh, sorry, I'm I'm a European, so column centimeters have been given over to the to the monarchy book or the Jubilee book. It's a classic political wedge issue thing, though. This is where uh, if you're a party that cannot seem to loosen another party's grip on power, you motivate your base by finding you know, what is the nerve that is going to turn out my voters against their voters, and unfortunately, it leans into the whole culture war debates that we have been. Uh, unfortunately, experiencing over the last five or six years uh, in particular. I, I understand what the motivations are to do it. The problem with this particular book, however, I would su suggest humbly starts in the, in the halls of Westminster, where somebody cooked up this idea because it will play, it will tickle a particular itch among Conservative voters. And th this whole manufactured outrage that has happened since is is almost exactly what was meant to happen i think oh, it, it just represents a sad state of affairs frankly that that's that's where we are um we've given it far too much airtime so i'm going to move us on quickly matt is there anything else of the last month which you think stood out you've shot down my previous attempts to say the cooperation agreement isn't going well well okay fine i'll accept that and i'll say that actually this cooperation agreement seems to be going quite well so far at the moment i think that you see with the announcement this week of an additional 25 million pounds for free school meals i think that's a really positive announcement i wait with bated breath to see what the next thing is because the free school meals uh, policy has been one of the most highly publicized bits of the cooperation agreement because it's really easy to deliver i think that the major issue for the cooperation agreement will be coming down the line when you have to do the big ticket things like dealing with the rental sector, 
like dealing with the social care sector. I think it's really interesting that this week in the Senate, uh, the Minister for Finance and Local Government, Rebecca Evans, gave a statement on uh, non-domestic rates reform. Trust me, that is more interesting than it sounds, i.e. business rates, which was a sister statement to uh, a statement she gave about council tax. Essentially, it looks very likely that the Welsh government are going to use land value tax as a means by which they rate all property in Wales. That's a big step. That is something that can only be got through by a coalition of parties. Very interestingly today in the First Minister's scrutiny session, actually, uh, he accidentally referred to it as a coalition agreement, which I am sure the Conservatives will love, especially when Andrew Archie Davis has been tabling numerous written questions about the relationship of Plaid and Labour, and especially Adam Price's role in the Welsh Government. So again, I think it's going a bit better, the cooperation agreement, but I think the Conservatives are going to really start to push hard on it being a coalition in order to try and uh, lose Plaid some short money. Good points, good point. I, I think the the point around the, the tax you made there, I'd pass me by, but that does sound like a a really big piece of uh, legislation or change when it comes in. Yeah, will they get permission to do that, though? Because they, they have an ELCO-like system that they've got to use in order to get new tax powers. All covered by local government. It's all relating to local government finance arrangements. Mm. And as, as someone who delivered an ELCO, please don't mention it again. <laughs> it, it's still painful. But that's why, that's why we still don't have vacant land tax in Wales, because even though it's like a really s- simple tax to, to work with, it was floated by the Mark Drakeford when he was finance uh, minister back in 2000 and uh, ages ago. Basically, they did all the hard work. They followed the ALCO-like system for new tax powers that the Treasury insisted they follow. They did it all to the completion. And then by the time they completed it, the Treasury in London said, oh, not sure about this. Can you start over again? And, and the whole thing fell away. And even now, they don't have permission from the Treasury in London to develop to implement this new tax, even though it's all the hard work has been done. I mean, I would be curious to know whether they can find a way to get it done through local government mechanisms. But I know it seems to me that that, that hurdle will be a difficult one to jump. But I you know, hope, I'm, hope I'm wrong in that regard. Well, Rebecca Evans has talked a lot about having to get through the Treasury hoops on, on other issues. So I, I think you might well be right there, Rich, that it's going to be a, a long road to that. You know, we've just been talking about LCOs, but let's, if I may, just talk very quickly about LCMs, the process by which Westminster legislates in wholly devolved areas where legislative consent motions, whereby the Senate gives permission to Westminster to legislate on their behalf. There's been a couple of interesting ones this week. The Senate uh, supported the LCM on the elections bill because Mick Antony has managed to get a carve out for Welsh elections. So the, ele- the elections bill, i.e. the voter ID provisions, will no longer apply to Senate elections or Welsh local government elections, which is a good. And as such, the Senate gave its consent to that LCM. But the most fiery LCM debate I've seen in quite a while was on the building safety bill. Now, you, you had, uh, this is the bill that essentially deals with the cladding issues, the de- defects by developers, creates a new housing ombudsman, changes the limitation period on, uh, on claims for defective housing, all stuff that should have been happening a long, long time ago. But essentially, uh, the Welsh Government has acquiesced to use the LCM, use the Westminster bit of legislation, the Building Safety Bill. And this received furious responses from the chair of the local local government and housing committee, John Griffiths, furious response from the chair of the legislation, justice and constitutional committee, Hugh Rankin Davis, and an absolute furious response from Alan Davis, who, uh, how do I say this politely, was was basically saying that he was voting only for the content of the bill and not for the minister putting it through. Uh, he said it was a bad way to do legislation. So uh, if you're watching out for tensions in the Senate, I would say the continued use of LCMs is going to be one because Plaid Cymru were furious about it too. And so were the Lib- and so was Jane Dodds, the only Lib Dem. Unsurprisingly, the only party really quite happy with their use was the Conservative Party. I, th- I think it's quite interesting, the stuff you brought there, Matt, because I think there is a lot of interesting aspects going on, perhaps about below the normal radar, in the Senate, and that's what I was going to pick up on, actually, for my kind of key points of the month, is stuff which is going on, which is coming out, 
which is really quite important, but I'm not sure how much coverage it's getting. And I'm not sure the big one for me was actually today, the ministerial statement, the, the one network, one timetable, one ticket talk of bus reform in Wales. And I think there's a future white paper. I, I thought that's going to be really big. We talk about transport a lot, infrastructure a lot. And that has such a big role to play in where we want to go in Wales if we want to take, get to net zero, carbon neutrality. And the bus system has really been the, the workhorse of public transport and doesn't really get the kind of coverage it deserves. So I'm glad to see that's there where it needs to be now. And earlier in the month, something I've worked on a long time ago in the past, again, it's around the environment, but the net zero industry body was created I think all these things are coming out during the month and, and I just not seeing if they get much focus. Um, so that would be my take from the month. There's, there's an awful lot going on. We've just got to be able to look. Can I pick your brain on buses, Kerry? Yours is the number 27. <laughs> Thanks for giving away my former uh, area of the city in which I lived. The, <laughs> the, the question I was going to ask, Kerry, is so my understanding of the new bus network was to ensure that local authorities have the choice about whether they bring, uh, they create new locally owned, locally controlled bus networks. What happens in instances where they decide not to do that? And what kind of negotiation would the Welsh government have to have with privately run bus companies in order to ensure that you could have this cross ticketing facility? I I haven't got into it in detail. The, The little geeky transport group I'm part of tells me that actually nothing's actually that new yet because there's actually existing legislation we could use to do everything that's been announced today. I'm not sure how true that is, but these are some pretty geeky transport bodies we're talking about here. I I just like the focus being back on buses. I I think if we're going to achieve what we need to achieve in terms of getting people out of cars, it is going to be buses doing that. Trains are great, but they only go where they go. And to get to stations, you still need the buses. And I think this white paper, the focus it'll have, I think local authority manifestos are going to be a lot more bus focused. I think Cardiff and actually, or Labour one, I shouldn't talk about the Labour one, obviously, because the one I helped draft is out soon. But the Labour one had a, had a £1 fare, which I think is going to be really good if that comes to fruition. There's even talk of a, of a new bus station in Cardiff, which is which is nice to hear about. But I just think it's moving things in the right direction. And interestingly, when we were talking earlier about uh, leadership contenders for Labour, I think someone who doesn't get mentioned but is arguably one of the best communicators in the Senate is Lee Waters. I, I, you know, when I, in the, back in those halcyon days of 2017, when I stood as a Labour candidate in a local authority election, Kerry, I remember getting criticised for... Failure to deliver on a bus station too, you know. It's good to see that times have changed. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't disagree with you on Lee. Lee is a very good communicator, actually, but I don't think, at the minute, I don't think he's considering a, a run for the leadership. Bloody hate buses. <laughs> I, I commuted on but on the bus on the A four seventy for six years, and it was six of the worst years of my life. It was mm-hmm. absolute hell every single day. Um, so, yeah, stuff buses. When I worked in Newport, I did Cardiff to Newport on the bus back and forth every day for about four years, and it would take me four hours a day. I mean, the problem isn't necessarily buses. The problem is um, it is just the fact that we don't have segregated bus lanes uh, and so that they, they get snarled up in the same traffic as the cars do. But... Um, Literally, buses are the only reason why I spent. I moved on to Arriva Trains Wales. I mean, how bad did the bus system have to be to push you onto Arriva Trains? <laughs> I'm joking, Kerry. I know that. I know exactly what you're saying, substantively. But um, you know, down with buses. Well, uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for having a nice, quick review of the month that was in Welsh politics with me. If people want to hear more from you, Rich, where can they go? On Twitter at Memosa Cymru. Mr. Davis, Kerry the Viking. And you can find me at Hexter101, that's H-E-X-T-E-R-101. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard this evening, please do not forget to find us on Facebook and Twitter at Pod, and on our brand new shiny website, www.walespolitics.com. Thank you for listening to Hereith. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.